great to have with us today. This is for John. With, we, with whom we have worked, in a sense, together for long, because I don't know how long have you, have we somehow worked together, 20 years, no, not 20 years, but certainly at least 10. And, uh, and we are here for the opportunity of uh, presenting this international handbook on responsible innovation, a global resource edited by René von Schoenberg and Jonathan Hankins, Kekui, and uh, which is referring to, uh, to, the la to the itinerary of the responsible innovation as a global resource, uh, I would say, in the life of von Schoenberg and Jonathan Hankins and of some of us also, but in the life of the uh, European Union, at least, uh, I, I wouldn't say in the world, because the book refers mainly to the, what happened in Europe. But the issue which is raised by the book, by the book is, a, is a worldwide one, and in a sense uh, is something that uh, is there unsolved and net needing to be discussed uh, and to discuss this issue we think that 23 years of activity of the foundation has demonstrated that, that we are among the few reliable sources of discussion on this issue. The book uh, shares uh, and testifies this sum of facts, you know. But I think that nobody else can com com present and comment the what is inside the book uh, better than Johnny. So, please, Johnny. Okay. Um, I'd also like to extend my thanks to everyone involved today, to you all for participating, and to all of those behind the scenes here at the Foundation who organise the event and who run everything during the day. President Bossetti briefly touched upon the work of the Foundation, and today I'd like to offer my own interpretation and outline some of the developments that led to the collaboration between René von Schomburg and myself on the International Handbook of Responsible Innovation. My first contact with the Foundation came in 2006, one of my first tasks being the documentation of a Bassetti Foundation-sponsored week-long retreat for young scholars with Bruno Latour. And my role was to take notes and photographs for publication on the website in order to add to what even at the time was a comprehensive archive of materials that document the working and the thinking of the Foundation. Today, here in the Foundation's meeting room, we find ourselves sitting in the archive. Books, photos, minutes from meetings and events, held in paper and digital form, thanks to the untiring efforts of the staff. And not forgetting what came before. On the walls, photos of Giannino Bassetti, <coughs> the current foundation premises, when it was a Bassetti <coughs> textile company office. This is an archive of the last 25 years of work in promoting discussion, and more importantly, action related to the position and role of responsibility in innovation. Today, as we know, the term responsible innovation is well known and used in policy fields, by funding agencies, and within universities. The network around the foundation is broad and varied, holding different positions and aims. Within this array of institutions, the Bassetti Foundation is certainly not typical. 
It's one of the very few independent entities, non-academic, non-governmental, and the only dedicated non-profit organization working in the field. The foundation sits here in Milan within its own particular network and sphere of influence, one that I believe has led to its rather particular perspective upon responsibility and innovation. President Bassetti's experience in politics within local, region and national government have led to an approach that sees politics playing a fundamental role in both innovation and responsibility. But it also sits here in the Milan that's made up of workshops, high technology laboratories, housed in structures built on land that in other situations might be merely called the garden. A rich history of industrial and domestic design, the production of beauty as a goal. We can see these factors in terms of their roles in the social construction of the Foundation's particular approach, as I will now explain. The political and governance interests have driven thinking within the Foundation to address the issue of responsibility from a leadership and governance perspective. While the influence of family business leads to addressing them from an implementation perspective, that's a big word for me. For the foundation, innovation is implementation. It is not discovery. But in innovation, implementation relating to newness, untried forms of materials, and untried forms, untried approaches, all of which brings risk, but it also writes history. Innovation brings risk, and so it requires politics and will if it is to be implemented. <coughs> As President, President Bassetti argues, it not only requires a surplus of knowledge, but also a surplus of power to implement this knowledge. And as it contains risk, we come across questions of responsibility, political responsibility. From the newly published interview with President Bassetti, that you can all read once you have bought your copy or downloaded the International Handbook on Responsible Innovation that contains it. From, his, from this interview, I come to the following understanding. Responsibility is impact on history. The role of politics is to define the space of responsibility while making history. But moving away from politics, we also find the influence of the Milan family business work ethic, the influence of design, of Leonardo, La Bottega, and the role of what we might call functional beauty. In his interview, Bassetti states that something that is beautiful cannot be irresponsible. But such a statement requires some investigation. That seems to depend, to me, on what you call beauty. One of the aspects of the EU interpretation of responsible innovation could be, in, of how responsible innovation could be implemented, rests upon project aims, goals. And these goals, the goals and parameters, should be responsible, the methods responsible. They should work towards addressing pressing European issues. They are based upon missions. These aims and these missions are values. Included in ideas of environmental protection, healthy ageing and public welfare. But unfortunately, President Bassetti, beauty is missing. But in an artisan setting, beauty can be a driving force. But in order to understand how this relates to responsibility, we might have to think about how beauty is ascribed. 
In a small workshop of skilled practitioners in any field, decisions about the work or production process are taken every day. Those working within the process share a social relationship within the workplace, but they also share a relationship of responsibility to the process. We might imagine that experts share their skills, but they also share their opinions and their philosophies during the development of projects, a distillation of which is then put into practice during the production process. <coughs> From the start of the project to its final completion, the production of something, of an object, an item, the product, constant discussion has steered the process. A language has developed. Goals have been understood and shared. A product, a piece of art, a robotic machine, an arc or lamp, a supply chain. Is it a piece of art fit for Bassetti's definition? If we could see beauty as derived from a shared understanding of the process, then yes, his statement holds. In a small workshop, skilled workers experience the learning process through immersion. The experience of working within a workplace allows them not only to learn the techniques necessary, but to also learn and share the reasoning behind the choices made during the process. These choices are not only material, they are value choices, their reasoning shared and understood. They learn which material and value choices have to be made and how the issues that this choice, these choices raise, raise and are resolved. They judge the correctness of their assumptions and answers. Were they fully justified? Were all the necessary questions asked? These are questions of responsibility. Once the product is finished, they look at it together. They have what Christina Grasseni calls a skilled vision, an insider view. They can see the process, its choices, its reasoning, and the personal beliefs that went into these choices. They see not only the aesthetic beauty, if it is aesthetically beautiful, but they see the beauty of the choices that went into the process, the poetry, the philosophy, the skills, and the reasoning. And if it's flawless within their capabilities, and given all of the economic and time, con time constraints, then it's beautiful. And this beauty, this shared understanding, built through experience, could be seen as responsible. It is responsibility to the, program, to the process. After all, it's either beautiful or it's not. There is no grey area. Could that be an explanation for President Bassetti's statement? And if my argument holds that the process is socially constructed in situ through everyday relationships, we must be able to see the same process at work here, today, driving the Foundation's thinking. If so, all of you present here are influencing it through your participation. The Foundation approach and aims regarding the promotion of responsibility and innovation share a lot in common with René von Schomburg's ideas. The need to critique innovation as a good in itself, to address structural problems in how science is promoted, funded and valorised, the shortfalls of a system that tends to use financial gain as a factor in research design and the shared conviction that there could be other aims and goals. The need for radical rethinking. The handbook that I was so privileged to work on amply demonstrates the convergences 
that many of us here today have helped to guide. Many of the authors have visited the Foundation over the past 25 years. David Guston, Sally Randalls and Brian Wynne have all made multiple presentations here, as has René himself. Our colleagues from Ayre in Rome are long-time co-combatants. Eric Fisher, editor of the Journal of Responsible Innovation, with whom we share an editorial board. Pericle, Jack Stilgo, and the many members of the Virtual Institute for Responsible Innovation, of which we are a founder member. Details of all these developments are freely available here in the archive, in which you today all take your own place. We thank you all. It gives me great pleasure to introduce René von Schomburg. So thank you uh, very much for uh, thank you also for hosting me uh, yet again, uh, President Bassetti. I'm very honoured to be uh, here and uh, to see also uh, some old friends and uh, and and also new people, of course. So maybe Johnny, you have to warn me when I talk longer than 15 minutes, okay. so because I tend to get lost so so because we are here of course to discuss things and and, and not to expose you to to many uh, to ma many lectures um, so please also do interrupt me at any time you wish uh, well for me I mean the short term or the short uh, a definition of responsible innovation is simply driving innovations towards uh, social desirable ends now this sounds uh, very simple, but very but almost every single uh, word in this simple sentence is uh, problematic and it's not implemented right now. Uh, I actually argue responsible innovation doesn't exist. What I'm what I care about is bringing about it's it's a sort of social political project to to um, bring about a new innovation paradigm which will make responsible innovation at first possible. And this has to do with all the problematic keywords in my short definition. Uh, what does it mean, social desirable ends? What is social desirable? How do we decide on it? That's already a problematic part. Currently, we have no mechanisms about that. All innovations uh, are more or less coming over us. They are the major chains, uh, uh, ma major agents actually from social chains. And if you think you live in a democracy, you actually have to realize that we are more <laughs> subject to chains than agents of chains. And so a responsible innovation in the first instance would bring the agent, uh, being us of course, back into the picture. That we will not be subject to chains, but agents of chains. Um, then, of course, the element of driving innovations towards them. How do we do that? We currently have no governance mechanism for this. It's f fully absent. We leave it up to markets. Um, so there are, just in this very short definition, only problems, no solutions. Um, let, me then, let me then start to, um, to, 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 to point out to a, a couple of what I and then this I, I elaborate to a more detailed extent in the handbook. Uh, what are the current deficits of the global research and innovation system? Um, maybe I will not use the slides for a moment, of course, uh, maybe this makes it uh, so then you will not stare to the slides, you have to talk to me. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the, the major deficit at the moment is, first of all, that, uh, as I already said in this short, uh, short definition, that um, we don't have a governance framework for uh, what we could count as uh, social desirable ends to which we will drive innovation to. We don't have... We, we, we have only uh, a governance um, mechanisms in place which constrains the market in terms of what can become on the market. So, for example, um, 
we don't, at least in Europe, for example, we don't trade organs. It's ethically forbidden. We don't clone humans. Uh, we, don't, we don't do certain things. So in other words, the ethics of innovations under uh, a, a market-dominated uh, paradigm is an ethics of constraints. You do certain things not, but there is not uh, a normative component into what you actually want to have. Um, and this is, this, is the, this is the first thing where responsible innovation comes in with the question of do we not need also a governance framework for what we want to get out of this. Now this brings me actually to a second, to a second deficit in the global research and innovation system and, and, and particularly illustrative for the situation we have at the European policy level. And that is namely that science and technology policy is detached from public values. Uh, it is the only policy at the European level which is the test from European values. All other European <coughs> policies are fully entrenched in clearly defined, consensually, actually decades, if not a century long, public European discussion on what these values are. So in European environment of policy, for example, we have uh, the goal of a high level of protection uh, from, for the environment and for, 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 um, um, for individuals. Uh, we have uh, values and trends in our food, tel uh, food policy, even in trade policy, but not in science and technology policy. It's the only policy which is uh, detached from those values which we are in a treaty. So my proposal actually is to make, um, to, to, uh, to change this uh, exception. If you look to the treaty, then you will see that it states science and technology is, sci the Europe, it states the European Union shall promote science and technological advance point, nothing more. This is it. There's no further explanation. There's no further justification. This is it. Now, this is in itself from enormous uh, governance uh, uh, relevance. Because if you probably all know uh, in Europe, everything is enormously controversial. If you would go to the European Council, they, they can argue about a single word or comma for days. But on science and technology policy, it's very interesting. <coughs> Um, if you look to the history, we, we sometimes double the budgets for research and innovation without uh, a, a problem. It's hardly uh, an, an issue. And why it is not an issue? Because it's the test from these values. This is why we don't make it controversial. So in the last uh, framework programs change, for example, till now we have increased again from 60 billion to 100 billion for a seven year program. Just like that even though the total budgets will go down. Now, even with, with the UK leaving the EU, it's, it's a significant loss also in terms of finance. So, um, science and technology <coughs> policy must be extremely good if this is possible. If you can acquire such huge budgets without much Debate. It seems to be extremely consensual against the other ground. So it's detached from these public values. Responsible innovation will, of course, make science and technology much more controversial because you want to detach it, you want to attach it to the public values again, and then it will become <coughs> controversial. It will raise the question uh, to which purpose we actually will have innovation for. So that brings me the, to the third point, to the mechanisms. Of course, there is a justification, um, but this doesn't come in the treaty. This comes is superimposed by um, uh, general policies, which simply um, uh, assume <coughs> that innovation is a goal in itself, and also steal us. These two elements are essential for a market-driven innovation approach. So, um, actually. The policy would state it doesn't really matter what innovation you get out of there. Uh, what matters is 
to have as much as innovation as possible and as fast as possible. These are the two, uh, two dimensions on which the European economic policy is based. And of course, the justification is that any innovation, whatever it is, will contribute to economic growth. <coughs> I don't know, is it, are there any economists here in the room? Because I have an issue with them, so it's, 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 it's a, this is a real problem. Because even the framework program, uh, I mean, it was the last framework program, was justified, among others, and you know, do an impact assessment on framework program. And I say, well, if we implement this framework program, then by seven years, or so by the end of the program, we will have 1.x percent growth uh, in GDP, and we have, I think, uh, one and a half million more people employed. Exact numbers. Now, this is very interesting, because if you go to the nature of technology, then everything is uncertain. We cannot even predict what will come on the market in a few months. We, all major technological change has been unpredicted the last 20 years. Everything is uncertain, everything is unpredictable. As we said already from the beginning in our diagnosis, we are subject to change, not agents of change. <coughs> so how can these economists then say in seven years is 1.2% and not 1.5 or 2? So it's, just, it's amazing, no? <coughs> So this economic justification is, is something which has to be challenged. And um, so I want to go to another paradigm. But, but this paradigm of responsible innovation requires uh, institutional change. And uh, let me see how much time I have. So I will, what I now introduce shortly is, is three different paradigms of innovation. So, um, this will be um, the first one, and I will take just an historical example. This is a drawing of, uh, I used it as one of my earlier publications on responsible innovation. This is, resembles um, what is called by a Portuguese monk, uh, Batamuleo. He built the so-called Passarola, which is in, in Portuguese it means ugly word ugly bird. So what you see here is a construct, uh, a drawing and an invention of him of what would be a machine which could sail through the air. And this works on electromagnetic fields, it works on uh, wings uh, and all kinds of other scientific things. And um, his collaborators also have claimed to see the thing flying over Lisbon. <coughs> Um, so this was designed in 1702. So he, um, he, he wrote actually on the basis of his uh, scientific invention, technical invention, um, to the king of Portugal that he could build a machine which fly through the air. And, um, and he also made an argument on what the benefits and risk of this technology are. And he used already this framing, because this is perhaps also for our discussion. Currently, technologies are very often discussed in benefits and risk, um, extra uh, policy context, right, which is actually problematic. But let's see how the origin of this framing actually was. So he said, he managed 2,200 leaks a day, <coughs> bring faraway countries news and orders, Furthermore, regions will be discovered to the Portuguese nation's benefit. So he more or less sells this to the king, just like nowadays uh, scientists uh, sell their medicines to uh, policymakers now. Um, he also says there are some risks. It's very interesting in the current context of the European Union. Many crimes will be committed as it's too easily to fly from one country to the other. Now, in the history of this case, so the king saw this letter, saw this construct, and he was immediately convinced. They did some experiments in his palace with balloons, and he was into it. And he said to Basil Maleo, look, I give you a lifetime appointment at the <coughs> University of, um, of Coimbra, <coughs> and you are going to work on this machine, um, but you are not going to communicate about this to anyone. And anyone 
who would copy you will have the death penalty. Now, this is the birth of the first paradigm. This is the paradigm of uh, what I call uh, um, the, the paradigm of state control technological development. The logic of this paradigm still exists if you look to the discussions on the non-proliferation of nuclear arms. Uh, this is the discussion of a responsible actor who says, I have control of the technology, me only, and I am at on the top of thing, and I'm the only responsible one, and I don't want others to have it. The others are, of course, the irresponsible ones. And you have that now in the discussion between Trump and Kim and Korea, I have the bigger button. No? I, yeah, this is what, still the same logic. So, but what is very interesting about this logic is that, um, let's <coughs> finalize it. So what is very typical of this innovation paradigm is that the scope of responsibility is both the outcomes and the risk of a thing. Of course, it's acknowledged that the technology has some risk, um, but the outcomes is useful, it's beneficial for the state, and that is the socio-economic assessment. The government's priorities is control. You can see it also actually with national energy resources. It follows also the same logic. And of course, the innovation paradigm we come in terms of policy is technological superiority. You see it also in, in space technology and so nations fighting with each other, or national pride issues. <coughs> it's still pretty much the same as in the um, 18th century. Um, the role of ethics is also interesting because there the technological development is completely dependent on the moral constraints of the governor. If you have a good governor, he can constrain himself, doesn't do strange things, doesn't use the atomic body. If you have a bad governor, it's a problem. Okay, so you are dependent on them. You know, whether, whether they are good or not. But this is the issue. So now, of course, where I was complaining about in the beginning is, is this major new paradigm, which I think is the current one, uh, and which has eliminated something from the state governance one. And that is that the focus is completely on the risk of the technology, but not on the benefits anymore. There, the government is out. Um, so what happens here in terms of governance is that we only have market hurdles. So in terms of safety, quality, and especially uh, the risk of technology, there we have extensive European regulations about, but we don't discuss things on in which direction it should go. So the socio-economic governance goes to macroeconomic advantages, as we argued just about innovations is, is not, it doesn't matter which one, uh, any innovation is good, and only the speed of innovation is relevant. And what is very typical in terms of funding is that we always fund research on technologies from which we hope this will bring our economic superiority in terms of our economic competition. So we fund either bio or nano or, or this stuff. Now it's AI, so you have all these hypes, and it was very, very typical for these things. So as I mentioned this already, this dominates is dominated by an ethics of constraints. Now, responsible innovation has these features. So as, I, as we argue in the book, of course, we advocate <coughs> that governments regain their responsibility, not just for the risks and the constraints of the technology, but also for the outcomes. And that we favor particular outcomes over other, um, that this thing is new. Now, so recently, I think, in European politics, you can see this shift very slowly. Uh, politicians start to agree that we all the money we stop put in this research system is that we want to get particular things out of it. Um, so this started off around 10 years ago in the Land Declaration where we started working on what we now call societal challenges or the grand societal challenges, so that means climate change, uh, food security, these type of things. 
So social desirability comes here into the picture, although there is still no mechanisms on how to decide on it. This is still, of course, empty. <coughs> we have not uh, mechanisms for that. So this is also a challenge for the paradigm of responsible innovation to try to address precisely this and to, to address the issue on how to make research and innovation responsive to public values rather than uh, uh, let them operate it independent from them. So that eventually means actually that what I call ethics as a driving force. That means that uh, ethics is, will not only be a, a constraint for technologies, but that ethics and normative principles will actually be democratically embedded in the construction of technology. <coughs> And you see this now happening in experiments already, uh, especially in the ICT fields, for instance, to, uh, to address privacy issues, autonomy of individuals in the design of technological systems, or what is now called value-sensitive design. So these things are happening, but not yet in terms of institutional change. So you see this paradigm set certain off, but most of these keywords are still only uh, wishes. There are no mechanisms to address those. So I will um, finalize this with where then the problems lie in how we can address this. And I think we need four institutional things. So this will sound all pretty radical, but the first, uh, the first change is actually that we have a crisis, two crises in science, which we have to address, and this is where I work in the Commission since the last uh, eight years on. Uh, first, I think we have a what we call a reproducibility crisis in science. Um, I just give one example from this, a survey in Nature, so this is supposed to be a good journal. People who publish in there, they're, they get highly rewarded. But 70% of the scientists who publish in Nature who have been surveyed by the journal claim that they cannot reproduce the data of their colleagues. And Philip Campbell, a former uh, editor of Nature, told me that actually 60% what is published in the journal at all is not reproducible. So I was thinking, well, this all crap what's in Nature. You know, this is what you learn in high school, no? I mean, if, if the physics, uh, if the things are not reproducible and the data is kept, well, what, what do they then publish? So this is a big, big issue. Uh, and the other issue is uh, related to this, comes from the other side. This is uh, an article in Economist, I think already from 2013. It states that 90% of uh, second phase clinical trials fail. Now, this has to do with the situation in science in which um, apparently we don't do this anymore as in the past. You see here a fantastic picture of science as discussion, uh, where you see Einstein and Marie Curie, the only woman in the middle. But uh, these were physicists arguing about uh, what they did for each other. Oh, they were you know, working actually in other fields, but they are interested. Um, this picture you cannot have nowadays for any science anymore. Um, this has to do with, first of all, um, people don't want to share the information anymore. They compete with each other. And secondly, science is so organized and micromanaged that even people in, within their own field don't understand what the other is actually doing. It's, science has become ever more knowledge about less and knowing more about less, without knowing what the other does about less. So this creates a knowledge uh, problem in terms of reproducibility. That's, but that's just only one crisis in science. I have another one which is more relevant even for our discussion. I call this the productivity crisis in science. Just also one line to back this, this bold statement up. And in recent research, states that um, from Bountra and other colleagues that roughly every nine years since 1950, uh, so the number of drugs approved by the US Food and Drug Administration has halved. 
So they come to the conclusion, actually, that science is not creative anymore. So we run out of ideas. Uh, this is their conclusion. Uh, I don't share the conclusion, but the diagnosis is devastating for science. What is going on here? Uh, we, we, we spend, we, we, we have uh, currently, we have more scientists on Earth than ever lived before. We spend uh, a factor of 100 more than in the 1950s. Um, but apparently the output is minimal. How come this situation? <coughs> so, <clears throat> one element is there that we have to open up science. So it's simply we have to share information as soon as possible rather than publishing as fast as possible. We have created a rewards and incentive system for science which makes science produce irrelevant things. Um, so this is quite, uh, quite problematic and it causes a crisis. I think we have a sort of similar thing as with the banking crisis. The bankers said, we are independent, we don't want, to interfere, well, we don't want interference from society, we know what's good for you, hence the economic financial crisis. In science it's the same. We know what is excellent science, we don't want to have societal interference. As a consequence, we fund scientists, but they produce not what we can societally expect. And if you look to what an article average costs, it's $5,000 for one article, this public funding to get it about. Now let's imagine, just for the sake of the argument, in 2025 we will have 200 million Chinese science graduates. Let's imagine they publish all one article for $5,000. So 200 <coughs> million times 5,000 is $1 trillion. And the average citation of a scientific article is one to two in its lifetime. Is one trillion dollar justifies this money, one citation? This is, this is the bankruptcy of science. We have to change the science and we have to change the incentive system. Otherwise, we will not improve this. So this is the institutional change number one. <coughs> Um, institutional change number two. So we have to shift from sharing, we have to shift to sharing as early as possible with all relevant knowledge actors. I mean, this is my short definition of the new science mode in which the, we have to go through. The second one is that we have to address uh, market failures. Uh, I, I will not go into it in the, in the depth because this would now take too long time, but people probably intuitively feel that, um, uh, of course, the market delivers on uh, better batteries or more. If you can do something more efficient for, sh for cheaper cost, then, then this works. But we don't deliver on transformational chains. Markets don't do this automatically. So there is a market failure here, which needs to be addressed. There are mechanisms for that, but which we also explain in the book, but I just highlight them here. And then I want to go to the... Oh, what did I do here? <coughs> the third dimension of institutional change needs to go about by what I call institutionalization of collective co-responsibility that actors, uh, not just the scientific actors, but all knowledge actors uh, work together and become responsible and mutually responsible for the production of the knowledge and to work together on what they produce. So that means also changes in uh, market standards for innovation. Now, there are some like, uh, you know, I wanted to mention Elvio Montefani and it's Andrea also, you know, Andrea Moca yes. So, um, uh, so these guys have done extremely important work in this area uh, of responsible innovation in trying to uh, develop new standards for, the, for, uh, for companies, for the markets, for responsible innovation. And why this is uh, so important? Because, as I said before, we now have only an ethics of constraints. 
we need also standards which give some directions to innovation. So this is why this is this has not been done uh, up till now. So so I think they have made a really a major contribution to that. So and finally, and I will then end here. Uh, we need. Uh, uh, a new form of governance which is anticipatory in nature rather than uh, only uh, responsive to changes. And to make uh, innovation um, and governance anticipatory, it means that we already have to act in the pre-legislative context in terms of setting up uh, normative uh, principles for how the innovation should look like or when they emerge. In the book I have given some examples on that, um, but I won't go into that, maybe we'll address it in the discussion. But I think we need on all these fronts institutional change in order to get back to the paradigm which we had uh, before. Uh, so, let me see. To be able to do this, so um, so again, uh, so my conclusion: responsible innovation is not there. There's still a lot of irresponsible innovation uh, out there, and so it's actually the other way around. Of course, uh, when I'm in Brussels in the house, and they always tell me, uh, yeah, well, "Why you work on responsible innovation? All research, all research we do is uh, responsible. Uh, so it's a non no, no goer in 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 my place." So. Uh, so yeah, I have a hard life there back in Brussels, but the, but, but the political, um, the political um, developments uh, are actually taking over without that the bureaucrats and the regulators realize it in terms because it becomes of course more and more a public issue in terms of where we want to get our research. And the positive news is that for the new framework program, again we have uh, too much money. <laughs> but we have even more money, but now we address actually uh, this dimension much more clear. This key technology, I mean, this language of course never goes away, it's very dominant, <coughs> but this is coming up now, and we will, we will have futures like mission-oriented research, we will be huge. The missions uh, are on cancer, on sustainable agriculture and so on, they are democratically decided, they have a long process, Parliament has been consulted. Uh, everybody actually has been consulted. Um, the missions will have a very clear RRI language. It's all about co-design and co-creation of, uh, of research. Involvement of citizens, uh, defining the research agendas as well. So all these elements are, will be in there. So this is a huge uh, test for our paradigm to see if it works, because it will be on massive scale, and there is political backing now to get this around. So I think I already talked too long, so I, I'll, I'll stop here. I thank again uh, uh, the Bassetti Foundation and Piero in Paris, especially of course for having us here to present uh, the book. This is actually our fifth uh, exercise uh, uh, with the book already, and uh, I'm happy that it's attracted uh, always a very engaged audience, and I'm sure it will be here the same. So thanks again for your attention. I think it's up to us to thank you, <clears throat> not only for what you said, and you taught us, but, but also for the type of uh, administrative work which has been done in this field along the ratios which we have been we have seen by the EC organization. Now, we, just to open the discussion, we think, and you heard that said by von Schoenberg, uh, what has been done is not enough, historically not enough, because uh, we, uh, we have s certainly succeeded uh, in uh, locating the problem as an important problem. This is the only achievement which can be discussed, because 20 years have gone through, 
But as a matter of fact, I remember very clearly that when we started 23 years ago, the idea of the importance of making innovation responsible was somehow exotic. I mean, it was not a felt uh, topic. <coughs> now it's not anymore so. I mean, uh, if you mention uh, in any in any uh, ambience, <coughs> but also in politics, the idea of innovation. Everybody is fully convinced that innovation has to be introduced. If you take the greater case in the ecological field, you see a, an example. I mean, we are all convinced that some innovation has to be introduced in our life to avoid the risk for the planet. But if you look into this assertion, you see that it's empty. I mean, what does that mean? Yes, we fully agree on the fact that something has to be done, but it, we don't agree in very much further. In fact, the idea of a, of a, of a uh, cyclical economy is getting ground, uh, but it's still a very, a very broad and vague uh, situation. Now, if we look into the problem, which is the one more specific for the foundation, how you can make innovation responsible, you discover what we discovered in these 23 years. The fact that innovation is in itself something that probably can't be made responsible from the starting point. Because what is innovation? Is we define it the realization of the improbable. And the improbable is in itself not only unknown, but such that you can't estimate it before you get it, you know. And this is the epochal problem. We have been discussing this morning in university with Professor Turin. Our epoch, is the epoch of the uh, lack of knowledge on what we assume to be our future. In fact, I, I think that never humanity has been concerned with the risk of non-existence because what we discuss about the risk of the planet is the fact that we may be cancelled from the history of the whole of us. So, uh, but how can you, how can you interfere with this fact that innovation is there, is relevant, but being innovation, you cannot forecast what it will be and therefore it is extremely difficult to govern the unknown. Theoretically impossible. In fact, what we are doing is to reduce the risk. It has been done, for instance, in the field of nuclear affair, you know, to contain some of the risk, but not to govern it. Because the risk, the absolute risk, is something that can't be governed. Okay. And so we face a problem which is by far broader than the one mentioned when you see responsible <coughs> innovation, but which is a a, an important problem for the future of the humanity. Now, uh, 
What is the sense uh, uh, of commenting on this book? Is the fact that through this book uh, you can get acquainted with the ratios the rational of the attempt which has been done in a political in a, an authority like the EC is and has been in this period and therefore I think that, that no as I said no one can comment on this better than the, the, the lecturer we have heard because as he implied and as said uh, what could be done to introduce the idea of innovation as responsible as possible mainly through procedures to say we can't decide what is responsible and what is not, but we can judge the procedure through which we handle the problem. No procedure is irresponsibility. The best possible procedure is the, the greatest responsibility because it's impossible nobody can be made responsible of, of what is impossible you know. here is where we are in fact and I don't know if you noticed uh, the reference to what he mentioned the change in the way the problem has been dealt with in the last 24 months just about so the, the assumption of moving of moving <coughs> to the procedure of missions no where responsibility can be recognized in the choices of the mission because cancer to spend a lot of money to improve the situation of the the, the struggle to cancer is something that can be judged responsible in a, in a rough way, you know. Uh, the same improve uh, uh, the impact, ecological impact, as I understood exactly, of our agricultural productions. That is another thing. But, in fact, in spite of the, of the decision of allocating money to some purpose, which is something better than allocate money without knowing for what, you know, but we, we haven't got really far in this field. I'm not saying that uh, we can go further, because as I said, it looks extremely difficult. But on the other side, we are all convinced that we have to find out the solution. We cannot go on handling in a fully irresponsible way uh, the type of problems we are raising when we are innovating. And from that point of view, the, the, the historical event of the greater immersion affair which is similar to uh, to Giovanna d'Arco in a sense <laughs> who expressed Greta it's difficult to say that she is the voice of, of someone of interest of the, I don't know the entrepreneurs the groups but I don't know. the world said okay Greta viva la Greta because it was advocating a problem that we all assume to have in our retro mind, uh, uh, but we also are, we are fully convinced that probably she is not the one that will find the solution. And also that <coughs> although 
the problem is mainly a problem for the youngster. Because in fact, uh, the risk of the disappearance of the planet is less for people like me than it is for my nephew, you know. But in fact, uh, it is something we, we should examine with, with the sufficient coldness and admit that here there is a problem. So that is the reason why we think that to get acquainted with what has been done in the most responsible, not only responsible, but, but also capable uh, authority, public authority, is a useful step. And that is the sense of, of our discussion of today. So I, I think that to hear about the reaction of, of any one of you on this, which is a common problem, where the foundation is active, but with this full con conviction that we have not solved the problem, and we will never be able to solve it alone. This is something that might be useful, at least for us, I hope for any of you. I want to raise something about more in the, the, in the field of medicine, procedural medicine, uh, because 50% uh, of the research or 50% of data creation now is in life science. And so when we try to create a, a paradigm for medicine, we are going, you are raising the issue of uh, agriculture as an example. Precision agriculture. I, I, I think that precision medicine is a super expansion of what's happening even in, in agriculture. Um, and obviously, we see clear uh, outcome problems. Outcome problems, I mean the E more or low that you have represented, so uh, two billion for one new pharma. But that is not the only issue, the issue is the delivery. When you were speaking about the cancer and so on. When you are delivering thousands of pathways, you will need to have an innovation in delivery system. So we look only to the products, but we don't think about the innovation services approach, which is of the same kind of importance <coughs> in this end. One, so I found in a hospital where we have a research center and we have uh, a, a university inside. Now we have represented here what, because we founded a, a, a medical engineering uh, university. We have doctors who have a doctor degree in engineering uh, to go on in uh, understanding better what we can do with this. So I, I see, uh, obviously, we see numbers that are unbearable in the future and some results in the UK, for example, the uh, life expect uh, expectations are after 60 years old, uh, are going down, uh, not going up. Even with all, that is a delivery issue in a certain way in which we have to understand which are the outcome problems that you have. But one issue is about mission-oriented research uh, or a kind of free research that have side positive effect, not only negative, that are surprising us. And so these are two issues looking what has been in the past, the, the impact of science uh, in uh, uh, the in, in improvement uh, of societal uh, uh, desirable. So how also a side effect have been uh, internet cases, something like that, very difficult to forecast uh, in anticipation. You were citing this kind of... So I was interested in this kind uh, of how we measure also non-mission-oriented great challenges uh, in Europe. I was working in the European community uh, in judging the um, activity of GRC. And so how the process, and so we were working in which way the GRC is consulting and advising uh, commissions, uh, but which is the process and approach. You are speaking about the process of, as the real innovation, in which way in the process of uh, suggesting science for better policy. That was the way that we were working around that. But all your science for better policy needs 
uh, to have a political finalization that was not really embedded in the process of GRC at that time, so it was more a technical approach. So this seems to me something around which we have to go on also in the language in such a way to can uh, manage this kind of different kind of innovation that we have. In a certain way, I think that the kind of Bayesian approach in which we try to manage also progressively the evolution of, of the research, uh, because to have all uh, at the beginning an understanding of the final uh, uh, results is uh, many, many times is very difficult. So to find a process of progressive process uh, that is changing the, uh, along the path. So this is a, a, an idea when we are working around that, in which way we can manage. So process innovation, in my opinion, is one of the process that is a responsible innovation. It's an example of process innovation. Process innovation is the most important uh, part uh, of how to go on in this, in this part of the discussion. That's anti-information in the interest of patients, in the interest of uh, uh, national health service, in the interest of national health service. When we look at the situation of the United States, we understand that we can take this a direction that it is absolutely unbearable and unsustainable. So I think that sustainability is one of the triggers that we have to put inside the evaluation of all those processes. Yes, because he said, uh, discussing that for instance in the United States, that they are reducing any sort of any attempt of, con of governing innovation. Because on the sake of the market, the idea where they Obama had located the 200 people, they have 20 <coughs> now, just about. There is something understandable. In fact, if the problem is impossible, it's better to forget about it. You know, but it's a very risky <laughs> temptation. Okay. May I? Yes. yes. I just want to go back to the beginning of your lecture. First of all, thank you very much. It was very interesting and full of stimuli. When you say that science is uh, totally detached from their discourse on values, I would frame it differently. I agree with no, I mean in policy terms. Right? Yes, but it's, I, I think, because the idea, it comes back from the 17th century, that science is good and cannot do, works only for the good. So in a way, I agree with what you're saying, but I think that there is no discussion on values because it kind of embedded, the, the idea of good is embedded with the idea of science, which is precisely what we should start discussing and what is being discussed in a certain level. Because I think that the fact that this is not even questioned, it's because the idea from back to the 17th century is that science cannot but provide the good for politics. That's my idea. Uh, I don't know if you agree. The second point, which I just raised, I'm very um, worried about social desirability these days. <laughs> because with the fragmented society that we have with very conflict that we have, you know, this social desirability, I'm afraid, is not, th is not something common, but it's very divided. And those in power, what they, <laughs> what they desire, desire, and they will probably be able to obtain is kind of uh, worrying for me. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I understand uh, your... Um, you know, on, beginning on the latter point, I, I mean, I understand your concern there, but um, this, you know, in, in, in this is just in my framing of it, actually that concern <coughs> is accommodated in the following way. You know, what I mentioned here in this paradigm is on a very superficial high level. So this is just to make clear that we, with responsible innovation as a paradigm, mm -hmm. we, we shift to innovation as an inherently good, to innovation to something which society demands in one yeah. way or another. Now then, of course, the subsequent question becomes, <laughs> how will you do that? Yeah. And this is, uh, of course, this is, uh, then all the problems comes in what you say. And so there we need, this is, what, so what the paradigm actually calls for 
is a mechanism. I mean, uh, you, you have been um, uh, for years, uh, and, uh, and, and Sylvia as well, been discussed. Uh, you know, all, all these issues of risk of technologies, and what you learn from there, in fact, is that if you would have a citizen input or society input there, is that people get frustrated because they cannot address the issues in that context which they actually want to address. But there are no prejudices or deliberative forms to address mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. So you, you need mechanisms, or in that sense, process uh, innovation is, is indeed uh, relevant here. Our, our, um, our, our, um, you know, our um, system has to also to accommodate for deliberations on this, this front. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, some say we do that already in Parliament, So, but as we know, Parliaments are insufficiently uh, <coughs> equipped to address technological change, so we need other mechanisms for that. So, and then, and so that, that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, where you point out to once you you want, and this is my argument, once you make this explicit, so if you, you let's say, do a sort of value-sensitive design of a concrete technological project, then you will discover that the <coughs> values, uh, which most of the people uh, would agree upon, become conflictual in, in the application. But, and then some oh, use this as an argument not to do, to do it, but I use this as an argument to do it, yeah, because yeah. this conflict will make it Absolutely. Will make it uh, will make it uh, visible, so that's another mechanism. So, so uh, I think we are on the same line of thinking. So, so you just only have to understand this as a label to see the shift of type of paradigm, because you know, as I said before, we don't have a, a, a we can deliver on responsible innovation because our current institutional mechanisms are not equipped to do that. So there, there is, and the first point was, yeah, well, they, 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 they are actually two dimensions. I mean, the, the uh, you know, the science as a legitimate of, let's, let's say, a la proper, uh, you know, uh, we need uh, knowledge growth and so, and that's also a good in itself. I mean, it's a classical uh, argument, of course, which I actually um, <coughs> don't disagree with as such. What, what, what I have problem have with is that we, have uh, we we um, we sell science and technology policy uh, in a way which uh, is is actually contrary to our own values because the other the other policies we cannot sell like that and if you would sell environmental policy in the same way as we do science and technology policy you, you get a major problem. So, and why we don't have this major problem with science and technology policy as well? I, I want to, I want to make this the same as it, with this example. When you make it concrete, I want to make science and technology policy equally controversial as environmental policy. Exactly, that exactly. So this is what has to happen, and this means the detachment to public values. One point that Europe is. Uh, in disruptive innovation, when we look uh, to the big companies in the world and what's happening, uh, we in Europe, uh, we lack, in a certain way, advancement uh, in disruptive innovation. I, I have some uh, doubt in which way, when you are looking uh, in allocating resources and in uh, a way that it is mission-oriented, uh, societal, uh, uh, desirable, in which way we accommodate uh, the evolution of disruption of innovation. That it is well, but, but how you yeah. manage uh, uh, no, no, it. It's approach that in Europe we have seen some weakness on, on the point of uh, facilitating and developing. But this was underlying also a little bit your previous uh, comment. Um, I would not advocate that all research has become mission oriented. I only say that with that we need mission-oriented research as well. It's something else. I mean, I, I, I think it's still legitimate to fund science for science sake <coughs> to some extent, uh, you know, but not, not uh, without certain constraints, of course, but one has to make it uh, clear, uh, you know, how we, 
how we uh, how we how we do it and this this phenomenon of mission oriented research in the way it's now formulated in uh, in the new framework program is suddenly revolutionary in a historical sense because uh, we have had, uh, you know, we had it over lunch. We, we had previously maybe missions in technical sense, you know, like, you know, you want to have a better battery or something. But that's the old paradigm still, which is, is about <coughs> achieving a particular technological potential or to maximize a technological potential. It's very typical for the second paradigm. The, 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 uh, the, the, wh where it comes in, what's new in the mission oriented research is that. Uh, the societal challenge becomes the objective, <coughs> and the technological uh, uh, part is, 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 is serving the societal part, not the other way around. Uh, so that's new and, and makes it also more complex, but that's not the only type of research we would need to fund, of course, uh, but, but it is in itself a, a, new, a, a new funding thing, and it requires some... Uh, New thinking and so on, but it, it will not be the only thing to do. But but it suddenly has an event uh, of of importance. So one does not exclude the other. May I? Uh, thank you. Well, I uh, I was reflecting on the same subject, and I would like to ask because I appreciate the the orientation of research according to societal challenges. It, it's also so a kind of romantic fighting for societal challenge as a researcher. But then the question I have for you is that when it comes down to the actual work programs and it comes down to the actual specific topics that are funded because calls for applications are very specific and, and you ought to be very targeted to what is specifically called if you want to get the grant. So is it really translating correctly from the societal challenge umbrella into the work program, in your opinion? Well, I mean, yeah, I, 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 uh, this, uh, this is a good point, actually, because uh, I, I can see, you know, there is where the devil is in the detail, and um, I think what is now, I mean, um, what I now understand, at least this is the intention on how to, uh, to execute the missions, we still have to see how it will go. But what will be new there is that uh, the stakeholders who will uh, will collectively drive a mission, so it will be really a research in co-designing and, and co-development mode with, with, with various stakeholders, including citizens, that also the research agendas will be uh, defined by them, or even also defined by citizens, which means then that the calls which will appear in the work programs will be based on on uh, on on those co-design elements it will not be done by uh the calls will not be uh, uh described by um, by uh, bureaucrats like me so uh, there will be other so it will be based on those things uh, that's at least the idea so that would uh, would uh, so, so so that so you see there are some innovations there um but it, of course, the missions will also be of a scale which uh, we have never seen before. I think not even in the history of funding of research anywhere. Uh, so uh, that it will be become quite complex. But this this is the idea. So it's it's also the cause who will be uh, co-designed. Uh, so um, uh, it's not a guarantee to success, but I think it's a good uh, good good, uh, good set forward. Chair of the uh, If you allow, I would like to extend the discussion uh, with uh, sustainable finance or responsible finance uh, because we have very similar problems. And uh, in uh, responsible finance, uh, presently what uh, we have, uh, we have three different levels. Uh. One, uh, you will invest if uh, the company complies with uh, ESG criteria, environment, social, governance. The second, uh, you will invest uh, uh, in, uh, I, I would say, if you have a, a kind of, uh, ex by exclusion, the criteria, which means you don't invest in coal, you don't invest in oil and the like. This is okay. But the third level uh, is investing on the positive impact. And there, you have practically no uh, responsible finance that is in this area. <coughs> 
Why? Because we have huge uh, difficulties at uh, assessing impacts. And uh, you have a lot of uh, research that was made in the recent uh, one or two years uh, highlighting the discrepancies uh, that you can get with this. So, for instance, the uh, Financial Times uh, published uh, uh, criteria on uh, assessing uh, companies uh, made by two different uh, assessing agencies. And uh, you get something that is simply randomly scattered, which means you have no basis to do this. And uh, when you talk of uh, anticipatory uh, assessment for a responsible innovation, we are probably a bit on the same area as well. Yeah? And uh, it's something, uh, as you know, there is a lot of work that is uh, currently under development in order to develop uh, quantitative criteria so that you can decide uh, investment A or investment D, B. But so far, uh, this is not yet in place. And uh, my question would, uh, just to take an example, for instance, <coughs> when you talk of uh, electric vehicles, uh, you have a lot of discussion about these type of things. The impact very much depends on why you build the, uh, the car and why you drive the car. Uh, for all type of reasons, uh, from uh, supply of electricity uh, and so on. Now, how do you see this question of uh, assessment of uh, impact uh, with uh, responsible innovation? Uh, do you see this also as a kind of a bottleneck? And do you see some uh, uh, options uh, or opportunities to do some advancement in this area? Or are we going to be able to have clear uh, objective criteria in order to assess what is truly responsible innovation? Knowing that uh, when you do an, an innovation assessment, <coughs> you can only do this in context which means that you have to look uh, from, uh, from the farm to the forest to, to go some, uh, from the mine to the, to, to the end use, uh, from the others. You have to go through this whole life cycle, and you know that this is horrendously complex. Uh, no, I, I, I actually uh, completely agree with your diagnosis. So, not just in, in your, you were referring to the financial uh, field, but uh, also in the research field itself, uh, I mean, also in the, at the European level, research has been evaluated already quite some long time, a couple of decades already, also on its impact dimension. And if you have ever been involved in research evaluations and look how these impact evaluations are being done, then, you know, I... I I can say it has been done rather poorly. Sometimes I've, I've, I mean, I, this years ago I already said we need actually something like impactologists. That's a whole new field, but, but we, we don't have these people, so there is no, there is no expertise. There is well, there, there is the awareness that we want to have assessments, um, but to do this well and and to have the expertise to do this. Uh, is, is rather poor, so that's really a, a demand which needs to be filled in, it's not there. And on the other hand, it's of course, like what you also say, a lot of these things evolve also over time. Uh, and so th sometimes the, 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 the requirement of, of impact assessment is shifted to requirements of monitoring or a requirement of flexible adjustment when research and innovation evolves. So uh, that's of course one, also one way of governing it. Um, but again, that's also not a, a, the ultimate answer. It's just one, one way to respond to it. So, but there are, there are lacoons. It's, I mean, you, you identified it, it's a lacoon. And, and so, uh, but this has to be worked further out. It's, I think it's in itself, we have also at the European level what they now call um, impact assessments for all the major legislative proposals. You know, if you look to the fear of it, it looks almost perfect, I must say. It requires almost everything. It requires uh, sustainability impact assessment, economic, social, it requires, I mean, any impact you can think of is required. But yeah, how to do this, how to do this, and, and ideally, these impact assessment should be broadly uh, discussed because of the reasons we were just discussing before. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, tragically, this is not. 
in principle they are all open, they can be discussed in Parliament, but it is not. So, uh, so this is uh, this is something uh, which has to be created a new culture, probably. Uh, it, 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 that, that's also what responsible innovation is about. It requires a new culture. It really requires a new type of expertise, and there are clear lacunes to which you point out. Uh, these are also the weaknesses of our approach. Uh, I, I, I have to confess. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just about what you just said. Uh, we are actually running a project as PAPERS concerning responsible innovation in small and medium companies. And uh, the idea of it's a Rosie. Oh, okay. yeah. it's, it's, a, it's not it's a, a, a... Yeah, Johnny, yeah. Johnny supported us in this, and uh, Fondazione Bassetti as well. And uh, it's what we found uh, as the most difficult aspect of this project is the, is convincing or at least uh, uh, making companies understanding about the added value of responsible innovation within their um, industrial and innovation process. Actually, it's hard for them, and they speak specifically about uh, SMEs, mm -hmm. um, that doing uh, innovation in a responsible way is something that can bring them an added value also from an economic point of view. Still, they don't understand the economic benefit. They say, okay, if I have to adopt this measure or maybe change my models or adopt this methodology, then it takes time, we are small, we have <coughs> other kind of cost, uh, we can't face all this investment. So bring me something concrete that behaving in a, in a responsible way will, will bring me something that um, valuable. Um, in some markets, in some fields, it's easier. Um, we met companies uh, working in medical devices uh, production or pharmaceuticals. In this way, they have somehow more the idea about uh, uh, ethical issues. They are obliged to, on one side, but they also believe that having a, an exchange of ideas with uh, people like uh, consumers, um, patients, it's something that can bring them something good. But for other sectors, it's really hard. And um, we've, within this project, we have five pilots, which is not a big number, but five uh, companies that at the <coughs> moment are going through uh, a responsible and innovation uh, uh, process. So we are supporting them, uh, understanding how to do this and uh, how to, to, to become responsible at the end. But, uh, it's, it's really hard. So I, I, I totally agree about the fact that it's, it's a change of culture that should be done at different level. And uh, the, um, the entrepreneurial one is, is one of the hardest to, to approach. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm certainly not an, um, a, you know, a, a, a specialist uh, in, in, in like what the, in the field where you now address. But I, I think one has to distinguish between the challenges you have uh, in a particular economic sector as such and what plays on the level of an individual firm. And then whether it's a big or small firm also makes a big difference. So if you say, well, uh, on, the, on the big firms, uh, I think there uh, you can, if you, the, the, the idea of responsible innovation Triggers actually off. I mean, we have actually an interview with one of big multinational in a book on DSM, who takes the issue of responsible innovation very seriously. Uh, but they can do that because, uh, as a multinational, if they want to, can uh, can take up this long-term view, and this is then also in their interest because. Uh, they will also want to sustain themselves in, in 20, 30 years from now. So they need this long-term planning, which is also a prerequisite of responsible innovation. Now, these small SMEs, they cannot do that. So that's already immediately challenged and will bring it also difficult to sell it there. But on that level, I think there's something else plays a role, uh, which I think, in, but there's just one dimension, and I'm, I'm not, a, not a specialist here, but in some sectors, it makes sense and awareness that uh, it's not the individual firm 
uh, who, who has the responsibility for, for innovation, but how does the farms who compete with each other in that sector relate to each other? And uh, so and this is why I use in, in the book this example of, um, or in the paper which I, oh, I think it was distributed on, uh, on uh, precision agriculture, if you have small farmers who work together in terms of data sharing, you will get another technology, you get another output, you get another, uh, you get even other products. So, but they would not all necessarily see each other as competitors. So, uh, yeah, of course, they are also competitors, but they share their data for common purposes, and and, and there the governments also can help by 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 not uh, by not retracting from that. So, so this is already uh, so this is a, a way of addressing it. Always the relation to that, um, and then I think a third element is that. You mentioned the pharmaceutical industries. It's very interesting that in a, in a, in a relative, or relative, uh, I mean, I think in a rich country like the Netherlands, they now discover already for, uh, for years that certain medicines are not available on the market. So uh, how can a rich country, I think uh, well, another, the Netherlands is in the top five of the richest countries of the world, how, can, how is it possible that they cannot supply uh, particular medicines there? And, and you will also see, even in Europe, some medicines are taken off the market, which are very useful, but uh, you know they are not produced anymore. So why, why is this? So we um, we now discover that uh, because we have left over the production of medicines to uh, a handful of multinationals, uh, who let's say operate or produce their medicines in India and don't care about what happens in Netherlands, it's too small market anyway. So um, that that the existence or the availability of a medicine on the market is not a social right. We now discover this only now. We only discuss it. This is not a social right. You cannot claim it as a right. This is a lack of public confidence. Well, we cannot claim it, so um, the, the policy makers and ministers, they are helpless. They say, yeah, well, we actually have to uh, um, make Europe more competitive and, and ensure that we will also have a company in Netherlands producing the medicine. Uh, it will not happen, of course, course, if you have a global driven market economy like it does now, it certainly will not happen. So. So the, there is an institutional, um, so there is also a dimension again uh, where um, uh, in order to get responsible innovation, uh, the, 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 uh, the retreat of public governance from certain sectors uh, is, is dramatic and has dramatic consequences. And we cannot uh, shift the issue of ethics to the level of individual companies again. So uh, I think we have all these dimensions. I, I think it's an insufficient answer, but, uh, but these are ingredients I think we still have to, uh, to think about. Yes, that is a problem. <coughs> this is a typical political problem because we base uh, the exertion of power on prohibition or authorization or norm. But uh, innovation is, is out of, of all these three. Oh, you can discuss <coughs> of authorizing innovation, you can discuss of prohibiting innovation ahead of, of its existence, and you cannot normalize. So this is an enormous cultural, but mainly political problem. The type of power to which we have uh, uh, assigned uh, the role of ruling our society doesn't work in an item like... And it's not casual that she is from Camera di Commercio, because I, I, I don't know if, if there is any reasoning on a parliamentary approach that is in between. But in, in, in the Chamber of Commerce, you reasoned from the side of the firm. In Parliament, you, you reason in terms of the common interest, 
no? because you are there to produce laws. And what has been raised indirectly is the end of the representative democracy. Because we, in our constitution, we, are, we have given power to people assumed in function which is not connected with the problem of innovation. <coughs> I mean, that is something extremely serious because you cannot advocate, you can advocate to the authority of the law of the state the last reference for this type of problem. But in fact, you refer it to the one having the less capacity of, uh, of acting as a governor. And you can also actually, if you, you, look to, you can look to firms and say, oh, you know, uh, you know in terms of ethical go governance, you know, what do these firms do and so on. But it's interesting to look to if, if, if a firm takes a particular initiative to do something very ethical, what then happens? I'll give you one example. There's, you know, there's, uh, there was uh, a lack of a particular, very expensive uh, medicine for a particular cancer treatment for a small group of people, actually. And uh, this is only available, made available by a company with a, a, it has a sole right, I think, to, to uh, or there's the patents on it. And it's extremely expensive. And there's a, a, a pharmacist in Den Haag, uh, a city where I now live, uh, and he knows how to make the pharmacy because the ingredients is rather simple, and he has made an instrument and he can make it himself. So what he did is he makes it himself and he sells it for 10% uh, of the top price to these patients. So a lot of people say, oh, you're right, this is a great uh, thing, but you see what happens on, what, what happened with this pharmacy. You know, uh, armies of lawyers came uh, there to uh, to uh, this 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 man uh, is, is 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 has got a nervous breakdown. So he, no, I mean this is so you, the, the, there is a, there is a really uh, <laughs> so it, it is interesting to think about. Uh, we know when firms do something wrong, have something, but it's interesting how our system has has, has so much. Retrieved. I mean, this is what my my major argument for responsible innovation is. It it does not lie on the level of an individual firm. Uh, I mean, it's of course important as well. But you know, we have we have retreated with private innovation so far to such an extent that um, you know a certain uh, social condition, which I think everybody here in the room would find intellectually unacceptable. And anybody who would, could, would be able to address it and can solve it would be seen as an ethical actor. But precisely these ethical actors will be seriously punished. So I mean, so I mean, this is no. I mean, is what, what you you don't agree, Sylvia? Yeah, yeah. No, I very much. Also, have other cases. For instance, one we reasoned a lot about. Uh, <coughs> on self-driven cars yeah. and uh, the fact that what is really stopped the adoption of it is the fact that you have to decide ahead in case of an accident who the system who will kill you know the old man <laughs> on the white uh, line or Instead, uh, the young one without cash, probably out of law, or the owner of the car, who is the last one that accepts a, pro a, 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 a program that kills him in case of an accident. So, I mean, the fact that innovation is changing the main assumption of, of our. Of our uh, Organization, political organization, and that is the reason why we think we have always thought that the problem of learning innovation 
is in itself, from the definition, an extremely difficult, difficult. I'm not saying impossible, but certainly that is the reason why we ask for cooperation from any sort of competence to, to understand that we are facing, in this case, one, we were discussing this morning in other fields, one of the problems that the change that science and technology have created in our knowledge. So it's not, it, 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 it's quite understandable that we may assume that anything we discover is a plus. No, because to know something more is in itself a plus. But uh, on another side, we are, we are not so far uh, reason on the fact that a plus of knowledge can be a problem, not just uh, again, uh, you know. Say prego. Uh, no. I'm very glad, uh, I have to say, I'm thrilled to know that in the next framework program, uh, the missions and the calls will be co-designed together with citizens. Uh, as Bassetti Foundation, we were invited to the uh, rise to revent. The rise was the high-level experts uh, group uh, to Commissioner Moedas uh, in order to develop uh, uh, the mission-oriented approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, uh, in that event, we really advocated to insert the voice of citizens in uh, designing, uh, identifying, uh, implementing, monitoring the missions. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the citizen engagement uh, was seen as uh, an unuseful thing, so I'm very <coughs> happy to know that at the end of the process, and I saw also the, the reports uh, made by the high-level groups, the uh, citizen engagement, and also Mariana Mazzucato's report, the uh, citizen engagement is a fundamental point of the mission-oriented approach, not just to uh, think about what is the societal values, opinions, but ask directly to citizens what are the, um, the criteria and also the priorities for them. Uh, in this realm of uh, public engagement and governing innovation together with citizens, uh, as Bassetti Foundation, we have made our effort since 25 years, as uh, uh, President Bassetti said, and also Johnny uh, uh, going uh, uh, through all uh, our endeavors during these years. And now we are facing a new challenge because uh, uh, we have just started a new uh, European funded project called Transform, uh, in which we try to open up the decision making processes in science innovation in three territories here in Lombardy region, in Catalonia, uh, in Spain, and Brussels city region in Belgium, through three uh, sound approaches of public engagement citizen science in Catalonia design thinking uh, for social innovation in Brussels and here in Lombardy through participatory uh, research agenda setting. That means that here in Lombardy we will co-design together with citizens and of course uh, together with stakeholders the next strategic program for research and innovation. <coughs> so uh, we think that this is a sort, not a solution, but it's an attempt to uh, respond to uh, what you call institutional mm. change, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, be responsive uh, uh, to public values when you govern science innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, we will see at the end of the process, after these uh, three years, uh, if we will be very effective, and maybe we can also uh, uh, suggest some uh, practices uh, in defining <laughs> missions uh, thanks uh, to uh, our uh, outputs and our attempts uh, in, uh, in Transform. So, uh, as I said, I'm very happy that uh, the next framework program uh, can be compliant uh, with what we really uh, would like to, to do since uh, 25 uh, years. Yes, I think on this final good news, <laughs> we can respect in schedule and our work of this afternoon. So thank you for um, having been with us. <laughs>
and many wishes to the following on of your activity, although you are changing it somehow and to become philosopher, and that is a good profession. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.